episode 223. Welcome to Data Skeptic, a podcast about data science and fake news from an algorithmic perspective. Here's your host, Kyle Polich. Coming to you from the Lamert Park neighborhood of Los Angeles, this is Data Skeptic, the only podcast endorsed by the Pope. Today begins our series on fake news. Over the coming months, we'll be exploring this topic from an algorithmic perspective. How does fake news spread? Does it actually influence people's beliefs and actions? How do we model it mathematically? Can we detect it with machine learning? And how can media platforms, if they choose to, prevent its spread? These are the core topics of Data Skeptic this semester. I want to open our journey by putting this into some historic perspective. There's always been false information. And there's always been people that spread it. What makes today unique? Well, let's go a little ways back in time and find one of the earliest examples I could locate of fake news. This story comes from a newspaper article printed at the end of the 1800s. It appeared in the Dallas Morning News on April 19, 1897. Aurora, Texas, April 17, 1897. About 8 o'clock this morning, the early risers of Aurora were astonished at the sudden appearance of the airship which had been sailing through the country. Evidently, some of the machinery was out of order, for it was making a speed of only 10 or 12 miles an hour and gradually getting toward the earth. It sailed directly over the public square, and when it reached the north part of town, collided with the tower of Judge Proctor's windmill and went to pieces with a terrific explosion, scattering debris over several acres of ground, wrecking the windmill and water tank, and destroying the judge's flower garden. The pilot of the ship is supposed to have been the only one on board, and while his remains are badly disfigured, enough of the original has been picked up to show that he was not an inhabitant of this world. The ship was too badly wrecked to form any conclusion as to its construction or motive power. It was built of an unknown metal, resembling somewhat of a mixture of aluminum and silver, and it must have weighed several tons. The town is full of people today who are viewing the wreck and gathering specimens of the strange metal from the debris. The pilot's funeral will take place at noon tomorrow. Now this was occurring, it was 1897. At that time, the country was experiencing what was called an airship panic or a flap of airship sightings, very, very much like modern UFO sightings flap where everybody goes out and, you know, they see the planet Venus and, oh, look, there's a UFO. That's Robert Schaefer, author and skeptical investigator. I first encountered his writings in the pages of Skeptical Inquirer magazine. He blogs at badufos.com. But at this point, they were not seeing alien spaceships. They were seeing airships very much along the lines of Jules Verne, because that was a contemporary fiction, a contemporary science fiction or fantasy fiction, whatever you want to call it, very popular at the time. There were elaborate stories about inventors who had invented steam-powered airships that fly around the country and fly around the world. Some people claim that the craft had landed and they'd met the inventors and so on. So this thing, you know, Aurora really was taking along those lines. Uh, it was very much in keeping with that. The claim was that the airship hit the windmill or the water pump. I guess it was supposed to be a water tower with a wind pump or something on it. It hit that and then it crashed and then the Martian died. And of course, a Martian wasn't a Martian like we would think like in Mars attacks or something. It was like a, a man, a small two foot tall man, and he was dying or died and they buried him. And so on. Now, later on, Jerome Clark, a UFO writer, and he's very much, uh, you know, a believer. He has a bad attitude towards skeptics in the sense that, you know, he says that we skeptics are all closed minded and whatever and whatever. But he investigated this and found that apparently uh, back in the 70s, there was still maybe a couple of old people who remembered this thing when they were children and they knew that it was a hoax and that that the guy who had told the story was known as a hoaxer and a liar and uh, supposedly even had like a liar's club or something. I guess that's what you do if you get tired of the lion's club or the elk's club, you go to the liar's club. Apparently they had something like that. So it's just a legend. And of course, there's no proof of any of it, but they won't let this thing die because, you know, once something reaches a certain size in terms of a story, a certain degree of penetration of people's consciousness, it's just too good to let go of. No one listening now was alive in 1897. So none of us really have the right context to understand the conditions under which this supposed Aurora, Texas UFO crash was written up. It reads more like an April Fool's Day joke. Hey, can you imagine how confusing April Fool's Day will be for some digital archaeologist a few hundred years from now? It's hard to imagine anyone taking this Aurora story seriously. And in fact, very few people do, even amongst the true believers in UFOs. 
With modern eyes, we can see the absurdity in the mechanical airship because we've seen the path that engineering took delivering the promise of flight. I see a great parallel here with artificial intelligence. There's endless speculation about how it will impact our species. Certainly the comments of those who speak most confidently on the subject will, in time, have the same quaintness about them. And just as rock and roll, Dungeons and Dragons, and video games all once stirred the cultural zeitgeist of fear, certainly many of the fears of artificial intelligence will prove unwarranted, although perhaps others may not. The alleged Aurora, Texas UFO incident may have faded into obscurity, but not every claimed encounter with extraterrestrials has faded from common knowledge. Oh, you probably think I'm talking about when Stanton Friedman resurrected and promoted the idea of a UFO crash in Roswell, New Mexico. No, I'm not talking about that legend. I'm talking about something for which we have incontrovertible evidence that it actually happened. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. <laughs> Orson Welles had the radio series called the Mercury Theater on the Air, where they would adapt great works of literature chosen by Welles and his team. And they were very invested in what they called the first person singular narrative technique to try and make it seem as though the characters in these stories were telling them in the first person uh, as the storyteller to sort of draw you into the story. That's Brad Schwartz, author of Broadcast Hysteria. But for the week of Halloween, Wells decided he wanted to do something very different. He had been paying attention to all of these international crises and dramatic events closer to home that had been reported on the radio by news broadcasters, most famously the Munich diplomatic crisis, where Hitler almost pushed the country into the Second World War about a year before it actually happened. Wells observed how people were on the edge of their seats, that this was some of the most dramatic radio that anybody had ever heard, and he wanted to capture it in a fictional context. So they picked the H.G. Wells novel, The War of the Worlds, about a Martian invasion of the planet Earth, which was 40 years old at that time. And they decided to dramatize it as a series of fake news bulletins, or at least the first roughly two thirds. The final part was more in the standard Mercury first person style. They did such a good job of replicating the style and, and tone and aesthetic of news broadcasts from the era that, as legend has it, and uh, many newspapers the next day reported, some portion of Wells's audience took it to be true and reacted in, an, in a somewhat extreme fashion. Brad's research comes with it a very interesting data set and a surprising twist. For the data set, Brad gained access to letters written to Orson Welles following the airing of Mercury Theater's presentation of The War of the Worlds, as well as letters written to the FCC about the broadcast. When studied, these two data sets tell a fairly different story than the legend most of us heard about this famous radio broadcast. What was the nature of radio at the time? You know, I'm old enough that I remember before things were streaming, you had to tune in at the right mm -hmm. time, whether it was radio or TV. Mm -hmm. It's always seemed peculiar to me that, you know, people wouldn't realize, oh, this is not the news hour or something like that. What was the nature of the way consumers enjoyed radio? Well, radio was still a pretty new thing for the American public. Americans adopted it remarkably quickly. You know, there's the old observation that many American houses in the late 1930s, they may not have telephones or washing machines uh, or other conveniences, but they'll all have a radio because they were cheap and they were omnipresent. And once you made the initial investment, it's hours of, of free entertainment and this sort of connection to the outside world. So people oftentimes would just kind of leave them on as background noise. Maybe not necessarily pay direct attention to everything that's on the air, but particularly if, as was often the case with War of the Worlds, if you're doing chores or something and you want some background music to listen to, you might turn the radio on, spin the dial, and then kind of forget that it's on. The idea that shouldn't people have known that this was not real because it wasn't listed as a news program in the, in the radio guide in the newspaper or anything like that. This aspect of radio listening could kind of do away with that because if people are as many frightened listeners apparently were, if they're if they're spinning through the dial, they might have come across what they thought was a musical program because the way War of the Worlds broadcast was structured, it began as this sort of copy of a of a musical program like many others you might hear on the air at that time that just keeps getting interrupted by these late breaking news flashes that get more and more intense until it pushes you into the alien invasion plot. So 
if you're spinning the dial and you come across what sounds like regular music and uh, you're listening and you hear one or two news bulletins, that's you people had been conditioned in some sense to accept that because of the Munich crisis, because of other things that had been happening earlier that year and earlier in the decade, people had come to expect that at any time, no matter what they were listening to, somebody could break in with uh, with a news flash. And in this case, those news flashes just weren't to be trusted. So we'll definitely get into the magnitude of the hysteria, but I think it would be wrong to say that there wasn't any. Do you have any examples of some people who did react pretty strongly to the news broadcast? When I was uh, an undergraduate in college, I became aware um, at my university, the University of Michigan, that they had all of these letters that people wrote to Orson Welles after the broadcast. And I had grown up a fan of old time radio. I knew the story of War of the Worlds very well. And I was immediately intrigued at, you know, kind of what stories might be in, in there. And so I went and looked at the letters one day because I had a senior thesis that I needed to do and I didn't have a topic. And I was surprised at how few of these sorts of reactions there were, just on a, on a cursory glance. They were there that most people were writing to support Orson Welles and, and not to criticize him. It, it's, it's inaccurate to refer to the War of the World's Panic as entirely a myth, because I have seen both in these Orson Welles letters and then others that were written to the FCC that are preserved at the National Archives, you know, hundreds of pieces of firsthand testimony from people who were uh, listening to the broadcast, who were frightened by it. But rarely among those hundreds do you see people actually sort of taking the sort of panicked action that we tend to imagine from popular culture. You know, there was one woman who, uh, one of my, my favorites, I think, she and her sister were listening to the broadcast and believed it to be true, and they were living in New York City. So they, they ran outside and they didn't know where they were going, what they were trying to do. And then they went to a local bar because, as she put it, you know, she would rather die uh, around a few men than in her apartment alone. She and her sister sent uh, Orson Welles a bill for the drinks that they had that night. There were, you know, reports of a husband and wife bundling their their child in the car and, and getting it filled up with gas because they thought that this was that this was a real event. And then once they realized that it wasn't, she wrote a letter to to Orson Welles cursing him for putting them through both the stress and the expense of what would have, must have been less than a dollar's worth of gas, but that was still a lot of money back in those days. So there's a lot of little things like that. I discovered. Uh, and this was sort of one of the things that that keyed me into what the actual dimensions of this hysteria were, that a lot of the most extreme examples of fright that I found in these letters came from places like college campuses, dormitories, places where you had a high concentration of people living very close together, where things like fear and rumor become contagious and spread very quickly. There were several letters in the Orson Welles collection from people saying, you know, threw my fraternity into a uh, into a panic. People were running around, you know, going to get their girlfriends and, and head home, calling their parents, that sorts of thing. And oftentimes in these situations, it may have been that one person was listening and tuned in. And then because they believed it and started telling everyone around them about it, everybody else sort of accepted it too. Or that once they started telling people who told other people who told other people and the rumor spread very quickly, even among people who hadn't necessarily heard the show. And sometimes the people who responded in the most extreme ways weren't actually by their radios. They were just hearing these these rumors that were flying about. My other favorite, it was from one of these fraternities where a student noticed that his fraternity brothers were, were believing the radio show to be real and rather, he knew it was fake. Uh, and rather than tell them, he set up a prank so that one of his friends would, on cue, flip off the lights while he set off a firecracker uh, away from their sight. And he said something to the effect that, you know, Mr. Wells, you never saw such a scared bunch of college boys in your life. But again, he was in on the joke in that case. Well, with that in mind, would you say that hysteria is infectious? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that was one of the main discoveries that I, I made about this event. And, and, and one of the things that I think makes it so relevant for the 21st century, I always like to talk about it as one of the first viral media events in history, because it turns out not so much to have been the broadcast itself that frightened people, but the way in which the stories about it, the rumors about it were spread. You see in very many letters, people either writing to Orson Welles or writing to the FCC saying that, you know, a relative called them and told them to tune in or a neighbor came over from next door and said, there's something on CBS, you got to listen. Because the invasion, the Martians were landing uh, in New Jersey, 
um, not far from from New York City. It could be you know somebody in another part of the country calling a relative and saying something's happening near you. You should tune in. So it's the way it goes viral, the way it spreads. That people then, if you're if you're hearing about the broadcast in that way, if you're not just stumbling into it yourself, but if someone you trust is coming to you and saying you really need to tune in, you don't know that the show's only been on for twenty minutes. You may not necessarily even be aware that it's about aliens. You're already in a state where you're going to be inclined to accept what you're hearing. So I'm someone who's quick to point out that an anecdote does not make data. Yes. But in your case, you know, letters do constitute a data set. Uh, you've had a, a wealth of different re- responses people sent in, and you you know had mentioned that you know some of them were positive and and giving good support for the show, and some were critical. Roughly speaking, what was the breakdown? So the breakdown of responses to the broadcast differs by which data set you're using. So the FCC uh, letters that are in the National Archives, because those are more official protests in many cases that are, are sent to the government, you see a more critical response, more people who are upset about the broadcast. It's roughly 60-40 in that case, where 60% were opposing the broadcast and 40% were writing in support of Orson Welles. But there are fewer. There's only a little more than 600 of those letters. The letters that were written to Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater, a little under 1,400 of them, about 90% of those are supportive of Welles. The few letters that are critical of him are more concentrated in the people writing either that night or the next day. You know, once people had seen in the newspapers that the FCC was stepping into action, I think a lot of the people who were upset about it directed their protests in that direction, um, while the people who were afraid that Orson Welles might be taken off the air or something wrote to him directly. Having said that, I do think you see in the letters indications that there was this this knee-jerk anger among some people who were frightened that dissipated pretty quickly. There are multiple letters where people begin very angry, and then sort of come around. My favorite is one where someone wrote a very upset letter, you know, Orson Welles, you horrible, terrible person, and ended by saying uh, in a postscript, kind of crammed into the bottom of the page, upon thinking about it, I must say it was marvelous and accept my congratulations. Um, so, so there was this, you know, it's, it it was a very intense emotional experience. If you believe that it was true, you can imagine the sort of roller coaster of feelings that you're going to be on thinking you're going to die, thinking the world is going to end potentially, you know, who knows exactly what each individual believed. And then coming around, there's this rush of relief, perhaps followed by anger, perhaps followed by perspective. Another of my favorite letters, a woman wrote, uh, who had been frightened, to thank Orson Welles. And she said something to the effect that, you know, your your broadcast took my safe little life in its King Kong hands, juggled it around for the space of 15 or 20 minutes, and then allowed everything to settle back in proper proportion. It was all the benefits of a near-death experience without, without actually dying. If you see that in individuals, there probably was in the larger populace as well, people who maybe wrote an angry letter that night and then decided not to send it because their attitudes had changed. So there was a kind of a flash of anger, but it it didn't last very long. My name is Gina Nuss, and I'm a Galvanized data science alumni working at Unify Consulting. Thanks to Galvanize for sponsoring this week's episode and to Gina for telling her story. I got my undergrad degree in mechanical engineering spent all my career since college at Boeing. So I did a lot of different things while I was at Boeing and I was kind of getting to a point where I was ready to try something different and wanted to experience maybe a different company, do some different stuff. Galvanize is a collection of campuses where people can access the skills and networks they need in person to level up in data science. For where I was at in life, having been in my career for quite a few years, I was pregnant at the time. So the idea of starting a multi-year master's program wasn't really realistic. And so I liked the idea idea of being able to go all in, do full-time intensive education for three months, and be able to come out the other side with a new skill set. Galvanize didn't just focus on the academics part of it, understanding not just how to develop really cool models, but from the very beginning, how to get a business understanding, how to talk to the person that you're developing a model for. You'll be taught by industry-leading data scientists who will help you put your training to good use in developing a capstone project. Gene is involved in novel use of recommender systems. My husband works for a local trail run company here in Seattle, Northwest Trail Runs. We're also friends with the owner, and I ended up getting to work with a real company, which is great. 
what we ended up doing was using a recommender system, a collaborative filtering model, to recommend top races. But since the interest was not in making recommendations to the runners, but actually providing some business insights to the owner, I took that then a step further and we looked at which races were most often recommended in people's top 10. When we first looked at recommender systems, I thought, well, this is cool, but I don't think this is where I would want to focus. But going through the capstone project helped me appreciate that you can apply a lot of these models in ways that are a little different than you might initially think. Being able to think outside the box and apply them in different ways was something that really stood out to me. Learn more at galvanize.com slash data skeptic. That's galvanize.com slash data skeptic. So I don't have any evidence of this, but uh, I speculate that if I did some sort of survey, I would find that, uh, especially amongst young people, they may not have heard the original broadcast, but they know the story of the hysteria. What took place that made it have such a lasting impact on our culture? Well, it's really once the story gets into the newspapers at the time that you start to see the legend being built. Remember, this is happening October 30th, 1938, which is a Sunday, uh, late on a Sunday night, about 8 p.m. So if your newspaper is preparing for the Monday edition, you don't have a whole lot of time to actually do your, your legwork and figure out what this event is. One of the responses that, that evidenced greater critical thinking was if people were frightened or, or maybe inclined to believe the broadcast, but w- weren't sure what was going on, um, they would call an authority figure. They would call the radio station, they might call the police, or in many cases, they would call the local newspaper. And so newspaper offices across the country are suddenly on what is supposed to be a quiet Sunday night, getting these calls about, you know, some people say a meteor has landed in New Jersey. Some people say the Germans are invading. They don't know what's going on, but obviously now their hackles are up. They're inclined to think that something major is happening. And very quickly, they can determine that this is a radio show that people are responding to what is supposed to be a fictitious broadcast. But the nature of all of this response sort of being channeled at journalists leads them to believe that this was a bigger event or a more widespread response than actually turns out to have been the case. And then on top of that, you have, you know, associated press bureaus and wire services getting these scattered accounts of extreme behavior all over the country. You know, a woman in Indianapolis who runs into a church shouting that it's the end of the world, a guy in Nevada who goes to save the wife he was just about to divorce, these sorts of things. Um, So there's a sort of a nice bullet point list almost of panicked accounts, you know, one here, one there getting into the early hours of Monday morning now and you're trying to put your paper together, the easy thing to do would be to stitch all these together to talk about the phone calls maybe that you have received, tally it all up, and it looks like there's a massive panic caused by a fictitious radio broadcast. You know, this is really back before certainly Nielsen ratings or any good ways to judge the size of a broadcast audience Gallup polling and things like that are in its infancy. They, you know, people just didn't have a really good way, as we do more so today, of assessing the size of of an event like this. They connected dots that shouldn't have been connected, and they said that this was a tidal wave of terror that swept the nation. And that idea that that uh, you could do a fictitious radio show about Martians and make possibly millions, you know, nobody knows how many of people not only believe that it was true but grab the shotgun and jump in the car and head for the hills. That is a very seductive and powerful idea that continues to influence our popular culture today. So the Mercury Theater aired a lot of different radio dramas. Is there any reason to think that War of the Worlds was exceptional? You know, can we draw some parallel to like the Blair Witch Project? Did Orson Welles have the intention of creating something avant-garde in this broadcast? Well, the Blair Witch was inspired, at least partially, by War of the Worlds. So I do think there's a parallel there. I don't think Wells had any intention of frightening people. I mean, the show is is very clearly announced at the outset that it's a fictitious broadcast. You know, it was their regularly scheduled time slot. Everyone in the Mercury Theater, from everything that we know about the production, from people who were who participated in it. They all believed that the show was ridiculous, that nobody would take this alien invasion plot seriously, and they were kind of afraid of being laughed off the air. So that's part of the reason why they 
directed all their energies toward making the show as realistic as possible because uh, they were just afraid it was it was improbable and silly and ridiculous. But as I said, Wells's standard operating procedure in these broadcasts was to take a classic work of literature, something like Dracula or Treasure Island or Shakespeare, Julius Caesar, in one case, Sherlock Holmes, and to dramatize it in such a way that placed the storyteller, the narrator, the protagonist front and center, and tried to establish an emotional connection between the storyteller and the audience through the use of what Wells called the first person singular. Heavy use of narration, use of of sound effects and dramatic scenes fading in and out in such a way to really create an experience, as Wells would say, that was more like reading a novel than watching a play or a movie. Uh, Wells would say radio is a narrative and not a dramatic form. Most fictional radio broadcasts on the air at that time were essentially drama without pictures. Wells wanted to say, no, the best way to appeal to the imagination is to tell a story the way a novelist would. So in that respect, the first two thirds of War of the Worlds, the part that is is a fake news broadcast and that everybody talks about, is very unusual because Wells had seen, you know, how people reacted to these late breaking news casts. He was always interested in um, taking these old works and making them feel relevant or immediate. He did that on the stage with his Julius Caesar that was sort of inspired by the aesthetic of a fascist dictatorship. He does that in his films later on too. It's always trying to break down the boundary of time that can sometimes get in the way of us appreciating a classic work of literature and make it feel like it would have been to experience it back when it was first published. So with War of the Worlds, you know, it's a very sort of Victorian book set in the early years of the 20th century, written almost as a piece of history, looking back on an event that obviously did not happen. Wells is really the only way you can get at the book with in the style Wells wanted to do was to move it into the present day, to do it as fake news bulletins, to make it immediate and feel new. But that approach, that strategy was very different from anything certainly the Mercury Theater had done. And although there were several other radio shows that had played with the conventions of news broadcasting, nobody had ever done it quite to the degree, at least in the United States, that the Mercury Theater did with War of the World. And prior to your research and your book, how much scholarship existed on this topic? Not as much as you might think. One of the other reasons that the panic story survives among the the popular imagination is because two years after the show, there was a very influential psychological study done by a professor at Princeton named Hadley Cantrell, which was called The Invasion from Mars, a study in the psychology of panic. And Cantrell sort of came at the broadcast not as concerned with trying to establish the extent of the the panic. He pretty much took for granted that it was a massive event and did some guesswork as to how many people were, were involved, but didn't give it too much consideration. But he was more concerned with trying to understand why people were frightened. He's one of these psychologists and academics at the time who were very concerned about propaganda. World War II, obviously, by by the time his book came out, had already started. It was on the horizon when the broadcast happened. People had seen how effective propaganda was in the First World War, and they were afraid either that you know a hostile nation like Nazi Germany could deploy propaganda to harm us at home, or that an American Hitler could arise and use the radio to sort of hypnotize the masses the way people believed Hitler had done in Germany. Of course, it turns out to be more complicated than that. That was a very great concern among people like Hadley Cantrell, and so he sees the War of the Worlds broadcast, which you know is set in New Jersey near Princeton, happens basically in his backyard, as a way to examine the impact of propaganda and potentially to teach people how to resist it. This, as I said, leads him to sort of overstate the extent of the panic the nature of how and why people were frightened. You know, they spoke to to people who had believed the broadcast to be true, but only in New Jersey. Um, They didn't really talk to people who hadn't been frightened. So this study becomes wildly influential, and it's cited in history books as sort of a means to examine how people felt on the eve of World War II. And for a long time, it was really the only primary source, apart from the newspaper accounts, that you had um, to understand what actually happened that night. So although that book and the newspaper articles are frequently cited in accounts of War of the Worlds, 
there really wasn't a counterpoint until I learned about these letters at the University of Michigan and also at the National Archives, which because uh, particularly the, the Michigan letters are so weighted in the other direction, you really get to hear from people who aren't represented in the Cantrell story at all, that you can take all of this together and come up with a more critical look. Some people had done that. You know, Michael Sokolow and Jefferson Pooley uh, had written a piece for Slate a few years back, arguing that the Cantrell book, you know, pointing out its methodological flaws and how the newspapers got it wrong. But there wasn't a lot of hard evidence on the other side to say, no, this is what actually happened until, you know, you were able to bring in these almost 2,100 letters. So tell me about those letters. They must all be, I presume, handwritten or maybe a few were typed on a typewriter. Where do they live today and, and what's their future? Uh, more of them are typewritten than you might expect. I'll just say, you know, going through these as a college student, I was always pleased to see a typewritten letter because they were so much easier to understand than the handwritten ones. That clues you in on the class of the uh, respondent because the, the people who were richer, who were maybe writing from their business or office or something, uh, they had access to a typewriter. But the people who, you know, oftentimes tended toward the, the, the frightened who were coming from poorer backgrounds, they would just scrawl it on uh, whatever, whatever paper they had at hand. That's one of the ways you can judge the audience. A little under 1,400 of them are with the Orson Welles papers at the University of Michigan, which anybody can go to uh, Ann Arbor uh, and request them ahead of time to view. Although, and I'm very excited about this, the University of Michigan is currently in the process of digitizing all of those letters and creating sort of a database where they're keyword searchable, where they're identified by the sender and the date and all of that, based on some of the work that I did trying to get a sense of just, you know, what does this massive information tell us? So I catalog them all myself. And now the university is turning that and their own work into a database that will be available. The plan is later this year in the fall for the 80th anniversary of the broadcast. They're going to start making it available to schools and colleges, along with a lesson plan that helps teach media literacy and a resistance to fake news as we know it today. So that's a very exciting because that's one of the things that really jumped out at me when I was reading them for the first time seven years ago now. The concerns and the fears that people were voicing about the radio back in 1938 were surprisingly applicable to the new media of today. Internet and social media, this was going to harm the national mind, that it was making people more anxious or less critically minded, things like that. So I think if students today are introduced to the, the audience who heard War of the Worlds, they're going to find some similarities and hopefully they're going to learn to assess the media that come to them uh, more critically. So look out for that uh, in the near future. And the other, the 600 letters sent to the FCC and other federal agencies are on file at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland. And again, anybody can go and, and check those out. It seems that maybe the word hysteria anecdotally does apply to a few cases, but mass hysteria seems inappropriate of a way to describe it. Um, I appreciate learning, though, from your book and our discussion today that there is a historical context to it, but I can't help but admit uh, a, a certain prejudice I have. I, I don't know the word for this, but like a prejudice against an older time when I think, oh, how, what, how simple it was then and how foolish someone was to be fooled by that. And, and I'm a modern person. I would never be fooled in such a way. Yet I look around on the internet, as you say, and I see people being fooled by fake news. Can you compare and contrast these two events? Is the fake news today more sophisticated or just in a different medium? It's certainly more sophisticated. As media changes, as technology becomes more advanced, we acclimate to it and we need more to fool us, particularly with a lot of the, the fake news that you might see on the internet today, which, unlike War of the Worlds, is designed to deceive people that you do see more thought being put into how best to fool uh, the target. But I, th I think you're right. A lot of people have that prejudice. There was a show, a dramatization of the War of the Worlds panic done back in the 50s on um, one of these sort of playhouse anthology series that was introduced by Edward R. Murrow. And he begins by saying something like, uh, you know, oh, these are people who lived in a less sophisticated yesteryear, you know, where obviously we couldn't, we wouldn't be fooled in the same way today. But of course, people still fall for all sorts of fake news, as we have most recently been reminded uh, many times. I, I certainly don't think that we are, as a whole, any more critically minded than people were back in those days. 
anybody who tuned into the broadcast under the right conditions could have fallen for it in some fashion. Now, most people, as far as we can tell, most people who were frightened did not understand that the show was about aliens. Um, The Hadley Cantrell study estimated that it broke down roughly into thirds, that a third of people thought it was a natural disaster, a third thought it was like a Nazi invasion or some kind of military event, and then a third thought it was aliens or some, some supernatural incident. People who tuned into it under particular circumstances or who were told about it and then tuned in put their own gloss on it that made it more believable to them, which I think still happens with fake news today. Obviously, we are more inclined to believe things that accord with our personal beliefs or biases or prejudices. We don't give them the skepticism that oftentimes we should. And that is, you know, really now that you have these websites that are targeted toward particular political ideologies, people are now siloing themselves because of social media into only listening to people who agree with them. You know, in these dormitories or fraternities, when somebody tuned into the broadcast and it started spreading because everybody was in, you know, in a like-minded situation and more inclined to believe what everybody else around them was believing. If you're in a an ideological echo chamber and somebody shares a piece of fake news, the threshold of belief is going to be a lot lower. And that's how you see things getting spread very quickly on the internet that, that shouldn't be spread. It's a very similar phenomenon to what happened in some, some of these pockets of hysteria uh, that occurred around War of the Worlds. So the book is Broadcast Hysteria, Orson Welles' War of the Worlds and the Art of Fake News. I really enjoyed it, and I'm going to recommend listeners go and check it out at their local bookstore or on Amazon or wherever you like to go. Brad, what's next for you? My new book is coming out later this summer, August 14th. It's called Scarface and the Untouchable, Al Capone, Elliot Ness, and the Battle for Chicago. Uh, I have a co-author on this one, um, the mystery writer Max Allen Collins, who you may know from doing Road to Perdition and Quarry and a bunch of great crime thrillers and historical novels. Him being the storyteller and me being the historian, we've decided to join forces and do what we hope is the definitive biography of Al Capone and Elliot Ness uh, with quite a few surprises for people who have who know them only from the, the Kevin Costner movie and the Robert Stack TV show. Keep an eye out for that August 14th. For sure, yeah. As a former Chicago, and I'm definitely going to have to check that out. You, you'll learn some things about your, your former home that may surprise you, or may not. Uh, Chicago's pretty much always been Chicago. That concludes our first episode of the new semester on Data Skeptic. The coming weeks will bring you more interviews on subjects related to the study, simulation, prevention, and detection of fake news. Our mini-episodes will kick off on the topic of spam filtering, but will quickly move into ad tech, as the story of fake news is inseparable from the story of ad tech. In the meantime, here's a few previews of what's to come. But fake news is another category. It's just entirely made up things, constructed simply so that people can gain ad revenue for their website. By knowing that algorithms use those factors to rank content, I can create content that is engineered to trigger those metrics. You start you start worry, worrying about, are we doing censorship? And, and maybe that's the only way to solve uh, the problem. Thanks again to our guests Robert Schaefer from BadUFOs.com and Brad Schwartz from abradschwartz.com. Opening narration by Catherine Grant Sutty, and I've been your host, Kyle Polich. Don't believe everything you read online and enable two-factor authentication. Good night, everybody. We now return you to the music of Ramon Raquello playing for you in the Meridian Room of the Park Plaza Hotel situated in downtown New York.